Ok les gars, c'est la seconde partie de la conversation sur le nationalisme, la la dépression et so on. J'ai une question pour vous. Some uh, French president uh, earlier, uh, François Mitterrand, said yes. uh, said once time, once he said uh, at German uh, president, uh, he said nationalism is the war. Uh, what do you think about this? Because nationalism is uh, what is a war. It's war. It's war. war. Nationalism war. is war. Yes. Uh, no, wars existed long before nationalism uh, uh, throughout the entire history of humanity. Nationalism is quite a recent phenomenon. And uh, uh, so this is, uh, this is simply wrong, empirically, historically wrong. And... Uh... How you, do you explain uh, the, the acquaintance or the correlation uh, between, uh, uh, in the end of 19th century uh, and the beginning of uh, 20th century, uh, fascism, nazism, nationalism, and how now, but maybe in the first place we can respond for this, about, for instance, Souverainism, uh, uh, the fight between uh, souverainism and uh, mondialism, globalism, about uh, Trump, Bolsonaro, and even China. You know, uh, yes. some uh, people said it's the return of the extreme left of the nationalism and, and so on yes it's just a, a trivial question but uh, maybe in first place it's necessary to clarify uh, okay this. all right so nationalism emerged in the 16th century as you said in the first part yes as i said in the first part And as I proved in my first book in the trilogy, I proved it with numerous documents, um, Nationalism, Five Roads to Modernity. Mm -hmm. It emerged in the 16th century. Since then, it spread almost to the entire world. It emerged in one small country, England, that was a part of a small island, not even the entire island. And since then, it spread almost to the entire world. It spread almost to the entire world because it had great appeal to people everywhere. And this was because it endowed with dignity personal identities of every member of the nation. So nationalism really is a matter of dignity. We all think we all have now national consciousness, including people who consider nationalism a very negative phenomenon. What is nationalism? Nationalism is a form of consciousness at the center of which lies the belief that the world is naturally divided into sovereign communities of fundamentally equal members. That is, in distinction to all previous and coexistent forms of consciousness, nationalism is based on the principles of egalitarianism and popular sovereignty. Those are the principles of democracy. 
So nationalism lies at the very root of modern democracy. Modern democracy comes into the world in the form of nationalism. Most critics of nationalism do not understand. They never study the historical nature of nationalism, and they do not understand what it is. So they confuse it with some sort of blood-based uh, uh, particularism. This is not what nationalism is, though there are several types of nationalism, and one particular type that developed first in Russia and then in Germany, and in Germany received its most paradigmatic form, is indeed ethnic or racist nationalism, and it believes that national communities, which are sovereign communities of fundamentally equal members, are at the same time communities of race. Now, this is the third type of nationalism, historically third. The first two types of nationalism to emerge did not confuse the national community with the community of race. And those are the, the original English nationalism, which considers the community to be a composite entity, a community of equal and free individuals. That is sovereign and fundamentally equal. And this type of nationalism gives rise to the institutions of liberal democracy, such as in the United States and in Britain, originally. Now, in the United States, this type of nationalism has been gradually given way to the ethnic or racist nationalism, similar to that of Germany. It was in particular giving place to the ethnic and racist nationalism similar to that of Germany on the left, on the left. So all the identity politics that are so prominent today in the United States are expressions of ethnic or racist nationalism. Trump's nationalism was an attempt to bring back the original liberal democratic American nationalism that regards the nation as a sovereign community of fundamentally equal individuals irrespective of race or anything else, individuals who are by nature equal and free. So this was the first original type of nationalism that resulted in the institutions of liberal democracy. The second nationalism to emerge was nationalism that emerged in France. It was the second type. And it emerged in France around the time of the French Revolution. And the French Revolution was the act of self-affirmation of France as a nation. So this nationalism 
in distinction to the individualistic nationalism, individualistic and civic nationalism that emerged in England and at that time was spreading to the United States, this French nationalism was a collectivistic nationalism. That is, it didn't see the nation as an association of free and equal individuals, but as a collective individual with its own will and interests, to which volonté générale, to which the interests and wills of individuals who composed it were subservient. So, however, in distinction to the ethnic or racist nationalism that was to emerge in Russia and Germany, French nationalism was civic nationalism, which means that while the ethnic or racist nationalism of Russia and Germany believed that membership in the nation depended on one's blood or was genetically transmitted and completely independent of the person's will, the civic French nationalism believed that membership in the nation was voluntary. It depended entirely on the will of the individual to belong to a certain nation. For this reason, France as a nation has always been remarkably open and accepted people from everywhere so long as they wanted to become French. As they learned the French language, wanted to speak the French langu language and accepted the values of France. So it was indeed has been throughout its national history, one of the most open societies in the world. So you see, there are those three types of nationalism. There is not just one sort of nationalism, though the enemies of nationalism those who accuse people of nationalism and believe that they themselves are not nationalists, uh, they constantly equate nationalism with right-wing ideologies such as especially fascism. But they themselves are much closer to the racist ethnic nationalism than even the fascists were. Why? Because while all the modern political ideologies, all of them, are reflections of national consciousness, since this is the consciousness of the entire world now, um, let's say 98% of the world now, we are all nationalists. Those political ideologies necessarily reflect those three types of nationalism. So remarkably, National Socialism 
that is not Soviet. And the Soviet communism reflected the ethnic, or in other world, words, racist nationalism of Germany and Russia. Fascism, on the other hand, reflected collectivistic but civic nationalism of Italy and Spain. These nations have never been racist. Their nationalism is collectivistic but civic. And their record, historical record, proves this. Especially eloquently, it proves this at the time of the Holocaust. Italy lost only a minority of its Jewish citizens during the Holocaust in distinction to all other European countries that participated in the Second World War. And they all lost a majority, if not the entire Jewish population, but Italy lost only 20% because the Italians in their civic national consciousness on the whole refused to participate in the persecution. So in addition, among the heroes who saved Jews in, uh, during the Holocaust in other countries, there were some very prominent Italian fascists who are indeed recognized by Israel as the just of the world. Spain, remarkably, of course, it was neutral. It didn't participate in uh, the Second World War. Spanish fascists and Spanish states specifically did a lot in saving European Jews. So, Compared to the other disasters, fascism is not the worst of them. And people who now claim that they're against fascism, they're much closer to Nazism than they are to liberal democracy. So did I answer your question about the ideologies? Yes. Uh, and nationalism. Yes, but... Uh, if you what... want, if you would like to, if it is easier for you to speak French, you can ask your questions in French. Yes, but uh, I try to improve my English. <laughs> it's why, uh... Okay, then. Okay. <laughs> then no. let's, let's if, if have you it an English lesson. <laughs> If you don't understand, okay, I repeat in French. But uh, okay. how you articulate, uh, how you uh, link uh, your work about nationalism and your, your work about the, the illness uh, of uh, the modern mind, if you want. Because uh, um, if I, I read uh, you uh, scrutinely or attentively, you said in the first place the nationalism uh, permit or uh, allows the possibility to each person to increase uh, uh, in uh, each liberty. Uh, 
but in other hand you have also the isolation of the people the individualism the the bad side as the fascism and the nationalism nazism said and communism also said in the liberal society yes you have equality you have liberty but you are alone in your own interest and you are maybe isolated and it's why Durkheim said uh, maybe but you have corp corporation you have association you have the possibility to contrecar to to have a counterparty counterparty to 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 balance if you want the isolation to escape about uh, illness it's why he said uh, Uh, in his book about the suicide, uh, you have less uh, person uh, kill uh, themselves in the, uh, in the civil war, in the war. But when you have a good society, a society very liberal and very uh, happy, you have lot of <laughs> lot of uh, people kill uh, themselves. And now. What do you think now in uh, our electronic, uh, biotechnologic uh, society uh, with uh, stranger communities also, uh, which want, uh, don't want accept our uh, ancestral values, if you want? Um, how you? You analyze the the actual situations about your last book uh, um, about the you know the illness the modern illness if you want. Yes. Uh, in life, things do not come neatly packaged into bad and good. They usually both good and bad. For example, the process of life necessarily contains death. Life is good, but death is very bad. And yet you cannot have life without death. It is the same with historical phenomenon. Nationalism brings us democracy and it also brings us mental illness. Yes, how? And the more democracy nationalism brings, the higher the rates of mental illness. Because the principles of equality and popular sovereignty give the individual the possibility and in fact encourage the individual to construct one's own identity. Being fundamentally equal to all other members of the nation and fundamentally equal to them in the most important quality, that is, the participation in popular sovereignty. The individual has the right to decide where in society does he or she belong. The individual has the right and the possibility to make oneself. The individual has the choice, usually numerous choices, of who to be. Now, it is very difficult to decide who you want to be when you are very little 
and you really do not know who you are or what you are. You do not know yourself. So, from, and there are many, many choices, right? The individual may want to become the French president or a great singer or, um, I don't know, uh, whatever, fantastic general. While one is three years old or five years old, one really doesn't know what all those things entail. And those choices are very difficult. For many people, not for a majority, but for a very large minority, very large minority of people, this is a great burden, this freedom to make yourself to control your faith, fate, to take the responsibility for one's life is too much of a burden. And they become sick, mentally sick, or they try to escape this freedom, this freedom that nationalism gives them. They escape this freedom into totalitarianism, precisely into those <clears throat> flames of fascists and communist socialists that individualism is not good, that to be an individual is to be broken, as Marx said, only part of oneself, alienated from the species, alienated from one species, and therefore from oneself, that only inclusion in a total community can make, and this is what Marx says specifically, can make man whole, the um, solution to alienation, according to Marx, is a total community, that is a totalitarian community. Now, you will remember that uh, I actually wrote an article about that for dogma. Yes. That at the time Marx invented the concept of alienation, he was in Paris. This was 1843. This was the year when the Annal Medico Psychologique emerged in France, was founded in France, the journal, the very first psychiatric journal in the world. And madness was mental illness was the talk of the town in Paris. Madness was called in France, in French, alienation mentale. So Marx, who wanted to participate in the French conversation in his Deutsche Französische Jahrbuch, this is what he was publishing there, right? He wanted to participate in the French conversation. He invented this concept. He took this concept of alienation as mental disease ah, from not, the French discourse. Ah, yeah. no, it's not from Hegel? Uh, no, it's not from Hegel. Okay. It is, it is specifically from um, 
from uh, the anal, the French anal uh, medical psychology. Mm -hmm. Now, the editor of those anal was Pierre Bayarge. And he wrote in the very first issue in uh, 1843, this is when Marx came uh, to Paris. He wrote a huge introduction because this was the first issue and it introduced the entire new discipline. It was the first such journal Have in you the world. Have you seen the, this? Uh, of course. Ah, yes. Of course. How could I not see that? I wrote a book about that. Yes. Yes. Course. So he wrote this very interesting introduction. Mm -hmm. And Marx's economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, yes. where he introduces the concept of alienation is a dialogue, is a conversation with Bayarge, with this introduction. It is really Marx's response. Another thing that proves the nature of alienation as mental disease in Marx's mind is that just before he came to Paris, Marx himself was mentally ill. Ah, yes. He, uh -huh. Yes. Exactly just before that, he had a bout with manic depressive illness. Mm -hmm. That was very much at the center of the consideration of Bayerge. So, yes. Um, so you, you see, you talk about this in your book uh, about Of Marx. course, ah, yes, ah, of yes. course, mm -hmm. uh, there I is a, a, a big chapter uh, which includes this discussion of France. Because I have to translate your book. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know. But I, <laughs> yes, but I see you are very early in the translation, so you didn't uh, get to those chapters. No. Those are the historical chapters in the third part of the book. Okay. So I write there a lot about France because obviously France was extremely important in the development of psychiatry, yeah. which was the discipline, the very first medical specialization uh, that emerged in the world, the very first medical specialization, and Pinel was extremely important in that. So, uh, and then I wrote about Marx and Paris, and uh, I also wrote about what happened in Germany. Uh, so, the, you, all the historical development of... And do you know Pierre... Pierre Janet, do you know Pierre Janet also? Yes, I know Pierre Janet, but it is uh, much, much later. Yes. Uh, and um, because he wrote, he wrote this already, inside. This already was in the framework created by uh, the 19th century psychiatry um, in uh, France, in Germany. Uh, and in the United States uh, and England. But the United I, uh, States and England were the, the least theoretical of them all. The Germans were the most theoretical. Uh, so unfortunately, the later psychiatrists were very much influenced by that. Yes. About the alienation, uh, if you can, you can we say uh, it depends of each uh, epoch, epoch, uh, story, time. For instance, in the end of the 19th century, uh, 19th century it's hysteria, it's, uh, it's uh, melancholia, it's uh, 
uh, double personality uh, uh, and uh, after that schizophrenia and uh, uh, no, and now we cannot say that those no. are those are simply names that uh, psychiatrists were giving to this one particular disease that emerged and this disease it needed a new vocabulary because it was so different from all the other diseases all the other mental diseases that were known since the beginning of history in the beginning of history they were in fact designated as mania uh, and melancholia and people uh, when when this when this new mental disease emerged they tried to use those names but at the same time they recognized that there was something really different about what or what the english invented the word madness there was no word madness before the emergence of those functional mental diseases now uh those functional mental diseases they took three different forms from the very beginning and those forms were later designated specifically by german psychiatrists who um, developed the vocabulary they didn't develop the understanding at all they developed the nomenclature only the vocabulary the names so those three forms of this disease that when it appeared for the first time the english called madness the germans called them depression bipolar disorder that is manic depression and schizophrenia they are not different from each other they are the same the emphasis in expression is different but the nature of those diseases is completely the same and the cause of those diseases is completely the same such as <clears throat> what such such as such as oh, yeah. the cause of those diseases in all cases is problems with identity with defining one's identity that is created by nationalism it becomes so difficult for a very significant minority of modern people to define themselves to define who they are and they have to do it themselves the society doesn't do it any longer it is so difficult for them that they fail to define who they are. They have a very vague sense of identity. Now, the central expression of all those three diseases, they're, they're called psychiatry's great three, because all of psychiatry is focused on those diseases, right? Which are in fact one. So the main problem in symptoms for those diseases is our problems with the self the problems actually with identity with the self in depression this is expressed as self-loathing self-hatred in mania this is expressed as mania of grandeur overconfidence 
absolute irrational overconfidence. And in schizophrenia, this is expressed as the loss of self altogether. One exists without the self. But uh, now uh, about uh, our contemporary contemporary society and about also the failure, I mean, uh, of uh, psychiatry response uh, just uh, came uh, with could with, you could you move yeah. with medicament uh, with just uh, chemistry the response yeah. uh, of psychiatry is very uh, reducing is very um, uh, what is the term uh, is very short if you want uh, about uh, considering the complexity of uh, the problem uh, you uh, you analyze and now how the state of the institution can can help uh, the people uh, which uh, have uh, suffered uh, about this kind of thing uh, because um, the psychiatry response is not uh, very very good uh, now because it's just uh, chemistry drugs uh, Maybe a little bit analyze uh, with Freudian uh, uh, attempt to uh, to uh, to allow some uh, solution, uh, individual solution. But as you see, I I it's uh, like um, uh, a no hand, no um, impasse. It's uh, if you want. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I. So I see uh, the impossibility now to to have a, a, a good analyze uh, except yours, of course. But uh, what is the, so the the solution uh, for the institution to to embrace and to propose some alternative solution? Uh, well, uh, it. Now we are already so far on our way to almost complete madness of society that it is very difficult. Nevertheless, it is possible. But it is possible only through the institution of education. And this education has to begin very early in preschool education. Specifically, children have to understand the difference between our society and other societies. That is, modern society, national society, and societies which are free national or non national. And they should understand what our society requires them to do, that it requires them to create themselves, that it gives them freedom. This is a very difficult, very difficult gift, a terrible gift. But it should also say that in other society, when the society gives everyone one's identity, it does not give them the freedom. That this is an exchange. And with the freedom comes dignity. And with identity that society gives, no, no dignity comes. So they should see what they like better. They should see that very clearly when they're very small children. After that, they should learn to make informed choices. That is, they should be taught to understand themselves 
not being taught that you belong to this group or that group. Because this doesn't give a person in a free society an identity. But to understand themselves, irrespective of any group. And then they can decide what they like and what they don't like. Do they actually want to become presidents or neurosurgeons? Or would they be happier if they're just gardeners or mothers and fathers? But now in uh, American society, now uh, you you thought uh, become a, a majority thought, for instance, uh, the free school uh, necessity to have uh, a free public school now, like uh, the, in the black uh, uh, institution, some people said, uh, la like Thomas Sowell, Thomas Sowell, I suppose, said it's necessary to build uh, a free school to, to permit uh, all the people to choose the, this kind of uh, of school uh, which permit uh, to construct this kind of mind as you said uh, it, it's not the majority now maybe no no it's no. not the majority but also um, it is extremely difficult you would need to completely revamp the entire system of education oh yes and not you just have... one school for you you would have to completely and you have uh, you have uh, education and you have a polemic uh, a fight uh, inside the democratic uh, democrat party inside the republican party also uh, all uh, they are very divi di divided like in very France. divided yes like so in to begin with you see to begin uh with a solution first one has to understand to understand what those diseases are if one doesn't understand what they are mm -hmm. if one persists in claiming that those are biological genetic diseases mm -hmm. then obviously no solution can be found yes yes yeah. first you must understand what those diseases are yeah. when you understand that those are actually cultural diseases that it is the society that is sick but what makes its members sick? Why is then it you would be able to arrive uh, at the idea of changing the system of education? But, but why if the you don't understand? Yes, yes. Why then, they don't then understand? Then it is not possible. Why they they, they don't understand? Why? Because they are why? not. <laughs> yes. Why they don't understand, Lucien? I... Because people are stupid. Uh, I Don't you think that people are in the yes. great majority are very stupid? But also yes, that's why they don't understand. But because also they have uh, wrong uh, tools uh, in the in theoric uh, models. For instance, right. they are very, yes. as we we said in France, scientists, scientists, not yes. in English way in French yes. way, like positivism, if you want, in the right, English right. way. And uh, they, uh, they d refuse to understand that the psychology and sociology analyze uh, are not the same tool that uh, physics and uh, chem chemistry. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. L look, Lucien, mm. you translate my book yes. uh, into French, and then let's have a discussion, a big discussion. Yes. Yes. You know, so long, the only people who are willing to discuss this theory. But how? Are the how? Chinese. Yeah. Are Chinese? Yes, huh? Chinese. Ah, yes. Yes, yes. because yeah. your book is, is is translating in Chinese. No, no, not now. Yes, it is. It ah, is. Yes has been translated and it's going into publication right now, yes. Oh, good for you, good, it's good. Uh, it's very interesting. 
Yes, it's, uh, but... Uh, well, you see, they, they translated my other books of this trilogy. Yes. And... Uh, Have you uh, invited, been invited in China to yeah. speak? Ah, yes. Yes. And uh, the reception of the public... Uh, was very good. Ah, yes. Okay. You, be, you become a star in China. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, unfortunately, I become a star in this completely other, wor other yeah. world, but not in my own world. Yes, and uh, I suppose because maybe uh, you have a lot of uh, old Marxist and Freudian uh, uh, people, theoric uh, people, uh, uh, who refuse to open their mind uh, or to... Of course. Yes. Of oh. course. Or uh, they don't uh, understand uh, Marx, <laughs> or Durkheim, and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, yes, I, I suppose in France it's the same way, because... I uh, think France is, France is still more open than the United States. The United yeah. States now, there is no possibility almost, well, no possibility of any open intellectual discussion. But France, I believe, is in a better position it still is uh, it has a different national tradition uh that the difference between them Tocqueville so very well understood uh americans are conformists but they're just yeah. conformists by by nature but and the uh, french are yeah. not conformists. but in and china very very in China also, they are conformist. Uh, no, no, no. In China, they're not ideological. Ah. You see, in the China, Mao they're not ideological. They're the pragmatic. Maoist. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're pragmatic. Uh -huh. Pragmatic means that when you have to play a Marxist, you play a Marxist. When you don't have to play a Marxist, you don't play a Marxist. Uh -huh. And you what know, it, I, it is a completely different view of the world so for example yes what is uh, 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 I you know when you travel there you constantly see that uh, everything goes so on the one in Beijing yeah the main main uh, road it's colossal it's fantastic this is the one where Mao's mausoleum is mm -hmm. so on the one side of this of this chaussée, you have Mar Mao's ma mausoleum, and on the other side, when you cross the street, you have the imperial palace. <laughs> you see, yes. and it is well preserved, and it is a beautiful museum, and ah. you can go the same day, you know, to Mao's mausoleum and then cross the street and go to the imperial palace mm -hmm. or um, in guangzhou guangzhou is um, is the city where uh sun yat-sen the the father of chinese yes. nationalism mm -hmm. you know yes. uh live and they have a huge memorial hall for him memorial that's very beautiful also on one side of the street you have this Sun Yat-sen's memorial that glorifies Sun Yat-sen's views and opposite on the same street opposite you have the headquarters of the communist party mm -hmm. you know which were the <laughs> the enemies he was their greatest enemy yeah this is how it is in China uh, it's very composite, bigger. It's very, very composite. Yes. Very composite. It's and very uh, what different. is uh, their interest to read you? What is uh, what is uh, what uh, they are found in your work? Uh, uh, well, that you see, American they, they the American didn't find. Uh, what don't don't doesn't want find. Uh, uh, well, they don't they became find. interested in me first. Uh, first, they translated my book on capitalism. 
mm-hmm. which is the second book of the of the trilogy on nationalism. So, uh, the spirit of capitalism, nationalism, and economic growth. They translated it very early. How it long? Was actually, um, it was in 2004. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think oh, yeah. this was the very first translation of that book. Mm-hmm. So they translated it, and people started coming to me from China, professors, you know, as vid- visiting scholars. And they would say, and they were not sociologists, not political scientists, not economists. They were philosophers, mm-hmm. Chinese philosophers. And they came to me and they said, well, your book, and then this book, I didn't even mention China at all. Yeah. And they were saying, this is the only thing that explains what happens in China today. So this, they understood that this book was explaining nationalism, the rise of nationalism in China. Yes, it's a good uh, experience you. for you. Because yes, uh, it's a ve- yes. uh, it's a proof it's a proof a verification effort. If the Chinese, yes. if the other people uh, yes. try uh, to interact, right. it's a proof that you uh, you're right. You, your yes. work is right. Yes. And after that, they translated my first book, Nationalism: Five Roads to Modernity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so they're just interested, and they had a very large um, kind of expose of my uh, of my views in uh, Shanghai Book Review, which um, which is, um, the, you know, one of the main intellectual uh, publications. Yes. And, um, well, they continue being interested. I have also very many now. And your I last book? I, your last book what? also? And my last book. So, this is a very difficult book to translate, but yes. they wanted to translate it the moment it appeared. And they have been translating it all those years, and now they finished the translation. Yes, okay. But the, uh, the Chinese publisher acquired the rights. Again, they were the first to acquire the rights. And this is because I have lots of contacts now there uh, uh, lots of scholars who, and I taught in China, you know, for oh, yes. five years, oh, yes. six years. Yes, yeah. present in a uh, direct in a uh, distancial in the by. No, internet. I was coming. I was coming oh, yeah. every oh, yeah. year. It was oh, yeah. like a like a constant visiting scholar. Mm-hmm. Every year I well, uh, came there. In uh, Shanghai, you uh, in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. In okay. Shanghai too. Shanghai. Yeah. But uh, main thing was in Hong Kong, and uh, I was um, coming for a month to six uh, weeks every year, and uh, giving master classes, and people but, uh, came from yeah. people came from everywhere in China. Uh, so th- those were basically faculty from young faculty from various Chinese universities and but then uh, I was invited how to you analyze uh, the, the actual regime uh, in China because it's, uh, you know I don't analyze the actual regime mm-hmm. on the one hand there is the regime on the other hand there is China and ah, uh, yes, okay, okay. <laughs> you know the regime is not necessarily what is the most uh, um, most uh, representative of what is going on. Uh, but so uh, it, the regime, the Communist Party, as uh, aware to your work and uh, and supervise your intervention. Uh, no, no, you, have no, you, they don't. No, don't. At least, at least they don't show themselves. So I don't know. Oh, yes. They don't supervise anything. I was, uh, free. Uh, I was freed. invited, uh, yes, uh, yeah. to give uh, lectures in Beijing, including yeah. at the May at the um, uh, at the University Renmin University, which uh, is the basically the university of uh, the party, and oh, yes. um, of and course. I uh, 
had wonderful, wonderful lecture there uh, about my third book and the uh, wonderful audience. But uh, uh, for, you, could say, for you, it's yeah. not the difficult to to forget uh, the Tanya man uh, repression, Tibet repression also. It's difficult to... I think, I really think that one has to understand what's going on first. Mm -hmm. And the, and believe, you know, when I, when I think that all the critics of those repressions... Hong Kong now. Of, of Hong the, Kong. Um, and Hong Kong yeah, now. Well, in Hong Kong, I have lots of friends who... Uh, who were uh, participants in the demonstrations and uh, and Hong Kong is a different place. Mm -hmm. But when one um, it's a nightmare for you should understand no. that the main the main critics mm -hmm. of all those repressions in mainland China are Westerners who were complicit in the Holocaust. I am not going to listen to that. Uh -huh. China saved more Jews during the Holocaust than the entire Anglo world combined. Combined? What is uh... combined? All of the all of the Anglo world. United ah. States, Australia, Britain with all its empire, mm -hmm. China saved more Jews. Uh, how? How is it? Say? Because the Jews come, uh, came in uh, China? How? Yeah, because the city of Shanghai, mm -hmm. one city of Shanghai accepted 25,000 people. Oh. And they uh, came. I did not know. On Japanese visas. Ah yes, but from Germany, from, uh, from not Ge from Germany, from, from uh, uh, the entire Europe, mostly from Eastern Europe, of course. And what time? There what was an extraordinary Japanese consul. Have you a book? Uh, have you a book? Uh, read, uh, uh, write, uh, written. No, about this, this is not. The book is not about that. No, no, I know, but. Have you give me a title of a book uh, which uh, describes this kind of story? Because oh, it's very uh, interesting. You, you, uh, well, I, I can give you the names. I don't know if there is a book about that. Ah, because it's very that, important. That it is an historical thing. Yeah, because you, know? you said you said uh, you refuse any uh, occidental criticism about. Uh, actual uh, China regime because the Occidental refuse to accept the reality of the Holocaust. Uh, it's it's no, your no, thought. No, no, not not because they not because they. But you are uh, right because be, before because uh, they were complicit in it. Ah, yeah, they are complicit. They were all you know, complicit you said. in it. Yeah, you it's, said it's, they knew. They knew Roosevelt. They knew and they didn't help. Roosevelt, Roosevelt Churchill knew yes, that you they have. They knew they didn't help and they contributed to it. Contributed. But have you, the, have you some proof uh, to say, say that? Have oh, you? yes. Oh, yes. There is so much proof. There ah, is yes. so much proof. Ah, I, and, and if you I want, like I can. Uh, book? Hmm? You have some books? Or there is there is a book about that, but there is also so many documentaries but it's and so many documents. It's very yes, important. There is, there is. It's very serious. Uh, you, as you said that, it's, it's very, very important. Have you... Yes. Have you realized, uh, as you said, uh, is very important because you said they contribute all the, the occidental democratic uh, people, intellectual, uh, political,
contribute with the Nazism to yes yes it's very it's why you do, did you don't want uh, accept their criticism about Maoist uh, regime. Exactly. I, under I understand and, and, your position. And at the same time, there is something more. They have never seriously criticized the gulags. Yes, of course. This is another thing. Yes. So when you think about the repression there and the things that were happening there, and they pass it in silence, and then they criticize China. I'm not going to listen to them. Yes, because China has also a gulag, the name of the China. Well, whatever, whatever. They may <laughs> call it a gulag, but C have they ever Cultural revolution. what happened in the gulag? Have yes. they ever criticized the gulag? No. They consider all this, you know, the wonderful uh, uh, socialism, uh, internationalism, whatever. They and accept. Millions. They accept Solzhenitsyn uh, in the U.S. Well, uh, yeah, of course, Solzhenitsyn was a Russian. Yes. And he is not criticizing China. You know, honest people first yes. criticize themselves, and then yes. they go to see uh, how others misbehave. Yes, uh, you are right. Uh, Solzhenitsyn uh, said anything about China. Said anything. Yes. No. He never said anything about China. Yeah. He said he was interested in what was happening in Russia. Yes, but he, criti the, he criticized uh, in the Harvard uh, discourse. Yes, he criticized right. Occidental. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Collapse because because he perceived how very false they were. Sorry, very. They were so false. So untrue, you know, so dishonest. Who? The, Who? the West. Yes. The Occident. Yeah, uh, with him. With him or in general? No, with Russia. With Russia, yes. With yes, Russia. You know, they didn't, for example, they, they never really criticized the, the horrible crimes that occurred there. They were all the time whitewashing it. Yes. It is uh, the difference between Churchill and Roosevelt also. Uh, how it, is, yes. it is the difference, of course, between Churchill and Roosevelt. Roosevelt was... Help oh. Stalin. Help a lot of yes. Stalin. Yes. yes, yes. And... Churchill. Except uh, Patton, Patton refused to to Yes, help. well, you see, but this was just one individual. Yes. Roosevelt represented the country. And uh, Churchill, Churchill was, of course, an extraordinary man. And so the moment he won the war for the British, they uh, decided to depose him. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, like uh, like De Gaulle in France also. <laughs> yes. yes. But, but it's very interesting uh, what you said now about China. Uh, you, do you want to, to write about this? Because uh, I suppose... I want to write about this. Yes, I want to write about this, but I haven't written yet. I, I wrote some articles, but not... Uh, no, because what you said is very important. If you said the, the Occidental... Uh, uh, democracy helped the Nazism in the first place, uh, and uh, yeah, they are very hypocrite uh, to now uh, criticize China, etc. It's a very strong uh, angle, a very strong uh, story, a very interesting story. I suppose uh, maybe the your enemies in. Uh, <laughs> in states who refuse to uh, to analyze your work and uh, and despite uh, your work uh, uh, you have I to don't think that yeah all right that you have to criticize yeah. them to uh, by this by this angle I suppose 
uh, to say, you know, my work is very um, um, is very important for Chinese Chinese. Why? Uh, because etc. But uh, you uh, you you criticize only Chinese. You don't understand why they are very interested by my work and because. Look, I, I don't want to participate in any private fights. Yes. Uh, yes, so I it, understand. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter for me that much. Uh, so uh, whatever. Yes. Maybe it's. Uh, if you want, we can finish uh, the discussion. Or you, you, you want to add uh, something else? Because uh, maybe uh, the last thing maybe is um, what is your analyze now, very now, with uh, the post-COVID uh, society, if you want. Uh, it's a new for me for me not for you for me it's a new totalitarianism uh, emerge with uh, big pharma big techn fa techno uh, firm like uh, some uh, google new youtube uh, uh, try to finalize to um, to organize, uh, as Orwell said uh, in uh, 1984, uh, a very um, to to organize your own mind, if you want. Yeah. And uh, what is your analyze? Uh, well, uh, um, you see the totalitarianism in the West has been uh, developing for a long time. Yes. It has been developing from the moment the Soviet Union collapsed. Mm. Because while there was still the Soviet Union, uh, the Western world, especially the United States, saw it as the other. And this defined them. They knew that they're not like the Soviet Union. So they were opposed to totalitarianism. But the moment the Soviet Union collapsed, this image of themselves as the opposite of the Soviet Union disappeared. And then they turned inside and started battling their real enemy, which was liberal democracy, individualism, all those things freedom, all those things that made them suffer and become mad. So this is how it has been developing for 30 years now. Uh, and I just watched it all this time. I worked uh, in American universities. And the change that happened during those 30 years mm. is astonishing. And it is very rapid. Yes. Uh, one feels here in the United States, at least in the universities now, exactly the way I felt in the Soviet Union. Yes. You cannot speak uh, your mind. You have to inform on your colleagues and your neighbors. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. There, you know, there is only one line that you have to there, there are words that are forbidden you can be arrested you can be you can lose your job if if you pronounce certain words it's unbelievable you came now, from uh, uh, soviet union in first place yourself yes you came yes i came from the soviet union mm. i grew up there i finished high school there mm -hmm. And you know, you know. Really and I know exactly. Uh -huh. And uh, my family, they have been repressed. They have been in the gulag. They have, uh, some of them were killed under torture by KGB. So I know that 
very well. And uh, you, you think in the Uni United States now it's possible to have the same way? Yes, I think that it is now possible in the United States to have the same way. I feel that we are on that slippery slope going right there. Now, COVID mm -hmm. provided an excellent catalyst for that. You see, totalitarianism has been developing, but COVID... With ecologism also, ecologism, Yes, COVID actually, the, the epidemic actually um, reinforced this development very much. Yes. And made it very difficult to oppose. And it's uh, hopeless. It's hopeless. Mm -hmm. It's hopeless or not? Yeah. Yes. 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 So. Uh, Because you have so some here, resistance. Here we are in this historical spot. You have some resistance in uh, some states, like Florida, Texas, and uh, and uh, South uh, Dakota, but. And even California now, maybe a new governor, a new governor in the California, maybe? No, with, uh, what is the name, Larry? Uh, what is the name of the, the challenger of the Democrat governor in California? Yeah, you're yeah, right. I don't know. He's supported by the ancient Democrat uh, woman also. It's uh, it's very interesting. Okay, well, yeah, uh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Maybe uh, uh, next time <laughs> we can uh, challenge uh, and uh, we can uh, I, speak. Uh, I would like if um, do you want to stop it and we'll talk. Okay, okay. Bye bye. No wait. Oh yes, yes, Wait. okay. But yeah. just I uh, yeah. I try yeah. oh, to I see.